Hello, and welcome to the We're Not Stump podcast. I'm your host, Mike Boland, and I'm a congenital amputee of the right hand. In this show, I will interview other amputees and allow them to tell you their incredible life stories. I'll also feature family members of amputees and others who support the amputee community, all in an effort to discuss the challenges and triumphs of those living with limb loss. So stick around and listen to inspirational stories and find out why we say we're not stumped. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the We're Not Stumped podcast. I'm your host, Mike Boland, and today I welcome a, a man with a very diverse and positive past, present, and future, and that's Terry Tucker. Terry is a former NCAA Division I basketball player, SWAT team hostage negotiator, cancer warrior for the last 12 years, and that cancer led to the amputation of his foot in 2018 and his leg in 2020. There's a lot more to this story, including him being a basketball coach and author. And we're going to talk about that and probably more on today's episode of the We're Not Stump podcast. So Terry, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on this podcast. Well, Mike, thanks for very much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. I am too. Just so the listeners know, we just had about a 15 to 20 minute pre-conversation and this is going to be a fun episode, but let's start it like we always do, like I always do, with a segment I call In Your Own Words. So I'd love to hear the Terry Tucker story. Sure. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I am the oldest of three boys. You can't tell this from looking at me or from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I went to college at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, despite having three knee surgeries in high school. I've got a brother who's six foot seven who pitched for the University of Notre Dame, another brother who's six foot six who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers and the National Basketball Association. And then my dad was six five. So we used to joke that if you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's chance you were going to see anything that was going on in front of us. But our five foot eight inch mother really was the boss. You know, it didn't matter how big, tall, strong we were, whatever mom said, that's the way. It went. So after college, I moved home to find a job. I'm really going to date myself now, but this is long before the internet was available to help people find employment. I find that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain in their marketing department. That was the good news. The bad news was I lived with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Uh, as I said, professionally started out at Wendy's, and then I went to work for the hospital that cared for my father and my grandmother, and then I made a major pivot in my life, and at 37 years old, became a police officer. Part of what I did during that was I was a SWAT hostage negotiator. After that, started a school security consulting business, coached girls high school basketball in Texas, but as you mentioned, for the last 12 years now, I've been battling this rare form of cancer, this rare form of melanoma. And then I guess just finally, my wife and I have been married for 30 years. We have one child, a daughter, who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an officer in the new branch of the military, the Space Force. That's quite the story. And congratulations on your long marriage and and your daughter. That's fantastic. What made you understand that you had cancer? What, What led to you getting checked out for cancer? Yeah, I I was coaching girls high school basketball at the time, and I I had a callus break open right in the bottom of my left foot, right below my third toe, and initially didn't think much of it because as a coach, you're on your feet a lot. But after a few weeks of it not healing, I made an appointment and went to see a podiatrist, a foot doctor friend of mine, and he took an x-ray and he said, Terry, I think you have a cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he did. And he showed it to me. It was just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that gave either one of us concern. But fortunately, or unfortunately, he sent it off to pathology to have it looked at. And then two weeks later, like I said, he was a friend of mine. I get this call from him. And the more difficulty he's having explaining to me what's going on, the more frightened I'm becoming until finally he just laid it out for me. He said, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years and I have never seen the form of cancer that you have. You have an incredibly rare form of melanoma. And most people think of melanoma as 
too much exposure to the sun, it affects the melon, the pigment in our skin. Mine has nothing to do with sun exposure. It's just a rare form that appears on the bottom of the feet and the palms of the hands. And because mine was so uncommon, he recommended I be treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. So that started my 12 year odyssey through cancer. And then through that, well, through the odyssey, which you are still going through, and we'll talk about that in a minute, you, you lost your foot first. And what kind of decision goes into having to get the amputation? I mean, if, if it is a decision, to be honest, I, I, I don't know how to ask that question, but I, I ask it delicately. How, how, do you, how do you go into that decision? I really didn't have a choice. I, I had been, you know, at the time I was diagnosed with melanoma, I was told I would probably be dead in two years. They had absolutely no treatments to offer me at all. They said, if there's somewhere we can cut it out, we will cut it out. Other than that, you'll probably be dead in two years. You know, but what I've kind of learned from that is that, you know, doctors are like Vegas. You know, they look at you and kind of play the odds. They're like, okay, you're, you know, you're relatively young. I was 51 years old when I was diagnosed. You're in good health. You're at stage 3B of this cancer. Yeah, two years. That's all you got. But doctors gave me a death sentence, and I thought, can I turn that death sentence into a life sentence? And I, I don't worry a lot about the dying part of this. I, I remember after I had my leg amputated, I found out I had these tumors in my lungs kind of jumping around. I apologize for that. Please. I, my doctor showed me my CAT scan from that time. And I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT scan, but you can kind of look at it and be like, oh, that sure doesn't look like it belongs there. You know, I had these big tumors in my lungs. I had fluid all around the pleural spaces. And I remember saying to my oncologist, how was I alive? And Mike, I'll never forget this. He took, he put his head down, shook his head no. And then he looked up at me and he said, I don't know because you shouldn't have been. Which said to me that, God's not done with me yet. When I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade. Spend more time worrying on about the living part than the dying. So when I, when I was initially diagnosed, they put me on a drug called interferon, just as my oncologist used to say, to kick the can down the road. We, we, it's it's not a true, it's not a treatment for cancer, but we're hoping it'll basically hold it off until something's available, and it did. But the problem was I spent five years taking a weekly injection of a drug that gave me horrible flu-like symptoms every week. So imagine having the flu every week for five years and knowing this isn't a cure. This isn't going to stop it from coming back. It eventually became so toxic to my body that I had to stop it because I ended up in the intensive care unit with a body temperature of 108 degrees, which is usually not compatible with being alive. And that was the problem. As soon as the interference stopped, cancer came back in the exact same spot. And there really was no option other than we need to take your foot off. And so it, it wasn't like I spent a lot of time deliberating. It was, this needs to be done. Okay, let's get it done and see where we go from here. And I can go two different directions. I was going to ask you about prosthetics, but I'm going to wait on that question because not only did you lose your foot, but a couple years later, you had to lose your leg above the knee, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That so, is correct. Uh, the, the cancer kind of worked its way up my leg into my shin, um, and they cut it out. I was in 2019, but then in 2020, I had a an undiagnosed tumor kind of in my ankle area, just for a better description, that grew large enough that it fractured my tibia, my shin bone. And this was right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. There were no surgeries being done. Everything was locked down and they scanned me and my entire lower leg was full of cancer. So there were, again, there was no option of, well, maybe we could treat it with chemotherapy or radiation or something like that. It was, you need your leg amputated above your knee. And it took a few days for my doctor to be able to get permission to do the surgery. And you and I were talking before about just how scary this was because the morning of the surgery, my wife literally dropped me off at the front door of the hospital. There was a nurse waiting there with a wheelchair. She put me in a wheelchair, wheeled me back to the pre-op area, which is this cavernous room that's divided up into 30 different bays, all designed 
to be treating patients uh, or getting patients ready for different kinds of surgery. And I was the only person in that room. It was me, an anesthesiology resident, and the nurse. And the silence was almost deafening. I, I mean, I really, other than having a broken leg, I wanted to run. I, I wanted to, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I want to get out of here. But I knew I had to face that. And my doctor told me initially I'd be in the hospital for 10 days to two weeks to work with therapists to learn how to function without a leg. And again, because of COVID, they sent me home after 48 hours. And if it wasn't for the generosity of an occupational therapist who had worked with me, who said, I'll come by your house after work the night I was released from the hospital, and I'll help you and your wife set up your home so that you don't have trip hazards and things like that, that you're able to function you know, in, in your own home, I don't know what we would have done because we literally had no resources at that time. In all the time I've done this podcast, I don't think I've heard that quick of a turnaround to send someone home. What kind of challenges did that present? I know you talked about setting up the home and everything, but mentally, physically, what did you go through during that time? Yeah, it was, you know, my wife had, uh, we, we had rented a wheelchair. I now have a wheelchair that has been specifically uh, built for my height and that. Uh, so we rented a wheelchair. Uh, we had a walker. Unfortunately, our uh, the bedroom doors, the bathroom doors in our home are not large enough or not wide enough for a wheelchair. So I have to transition to a walker to be able to go to the bathroom or to go to bed at night. Fortunately, we have a house with a first floor master, so we're, I, I don't have to go up and down stairs. I haven't seen the upstairs or the basement in four years now, so who knows what's going on up or down <laughs> in our house. But that part was was fortunate so i can live on one level my office my the bedroom and the kitchen are all on the first floor so it was just a matter of figuring out first of all pain management because i mean i just had my my yeah. leg amputated how are we going to manage the pain i was very i was very lucky i didn't have to take a lot of medication for that and then it was just developing a routine What's my day going to look like? How am I going to be able to get up? Where do I put the walker? You know, do I do I have a urinal or do I go or, or can I get up in the middle of the night? Well, that's probably not a good idea. Maybe it would be safer to be in bed. I, I've been very lucky. I, I'm going to knock on wood here. I have not fallen in, in four years. My, my nurses, when I get treated now, always ask me, you know, have, have you fallen? I said, no, but I'm working real hard on it. So, you know, <laughs> give me some time. I might get there, you know, but I haven't done it yet. And, and so, you know, those are the things you worry about because, you know, I'm older, I'm in my 60s, my balance is not great for an older person, and now I, I don't have a leg. So it's a matter of figuring things out. And yeah, you can get down and depressed, or you can be like, you know what, I got to figure this out. I, I got to figure out how to survive as a human being. I know I can do it. I've just got to figure it out. Yeah, your story has a lot of inspiration to it. That's what I really like about your story. And I want to talk about that, but I do want to talk about the prosthetics because when I said I could have went in two different directions, one of the directions I was going to ask you about that we didn't get to talk about earlier, earlier was, so you, you lost your foot first. Did you get a, a prosthetic for your foot? And then I know you said you got one for your leg. I'm curious about that journey for you. I did not get a prosthetic. I got an insert that, that worked in my shoe. I was incredibly lucky that... I was my my foot amputation was basically if you if you look down your shin so I still had my ankle and my heel mm -hmm. it was everything in front of it that was gone and initially I was told I was going to have a below the knee amputation and fortunately my surgeon knew of a foot specialist consulted with him and the two of them actually did the operation and saved me my heel and my ankle, which was much better for me in terms of, you know, I still had to learn how to walk again because I didn't, I didn't have my, my tarsals and metal tarsals, my toes and that kind of thing. But it was much easier than doing a below the knee amputation. So I had this insert and I, I did physical therapy and, and figured it out and, and learned how to walk with that. And then the, the, the leg, you know, you, you have to heal and, and then they, they make a mold of your, your stump. Yeah. My prosthetic is just unbelievable. I was telling you before we recorded, it, it is 
it, it's like something out of Star Wars or, or the future. It has a gyroscope in the calf that lets it know whether I'm in front of it or behind it in terms of walking. It has a microprocessor in the knee that allows me to program it to do different events, ride a bike, play golf, things like that. So it's an amazing device. It's incredibly time consuming. It's incredibly hard for me to walk with it because now I walk with my hip and butt muscles and I'm still being treated for cancer. So I'm, I'm tired a lot, I'm beat up a lot. So I used it to walk my daughter down the aisle. I worked very hard with physical therapy to be able to do that. But that's been almost two years now. And now it's just easier for me from a wheelchair perspective to get around that way than try to put my prosthetic on. I think it's fantastic that you walked your daughter down the aisle. What a, what a great part of your story. And we were talking earlier, you, you attributed some of your philosophies to your earlier years, and that has to do with team sports is what you said. So I'm going to be a little bit of a, just a fanboy right now because I love basketball. So I want to talk about that part of your life. You played for the Citadel, as you said, as a power forward from 78 to 82. What are some of your fondest memories of that time for you? Um, you know, it's funny that, that this occurred. And when it occurred, we had no idea how special this was. There was a tournament um, my senior year. I, I got to play against some great competition. I played against Horace Grant, who played with Michael Jordan yeah. uh, on the Bulls during their, their big run when he was at Clemson. Um, there was a tournament called the North South Doubleheader. And it was, it was really kind of a, you know, it's kind of like Alabama playing Furman or something like that in football. You know, I mean, it, it's just, they're division one schools, but they're not anywhere near on the par with each other. So the tournament was two teams from North Carolina, which was North Carolina and North Carolina state. And then two teams from South Carolina, which were the Citadel, my school and Furman. And the Citadel and Furman are in the same conference, the Southern conference, North Carolina and North Carolina State are in the ACC, the same conference. So it was a round robin. It was Friday night, we played North Carolina. It was Michael Jordan's freshman year. Wow. But he was not the Michael Jordan we all know. James Worthy was their big gun. James Worthy played in the NBA. He's in the NBA Hall of Fame. And, and I believe Sam Perkins was on that team, too. Sam Perkins was yeah. also on that. Michael Korn. I mean, they, yeah. they, they, that team, unbeknownst to us, would go on in 1982 and win the national championship. So we play against one national championship team on a night. We have no idea that's happening. The next night, we play against Jim Valvano and his North Carolina State team. Yes. Who the following year, 1983, they won the national championship. So over the course of one weekend, unbeknownst to us, we get to play against two national championship teams. And I mentioned my brother who pitched for the University of Notre Dame, he is a basketball coach. He's in the Illinois Hall of Fame. He's a basketball coach in Chicago and has been for a number of years. And he coached Michael Jordan's two sons wow. when they were in high school. And he tells kind of a funny story. He says, you know, one day we're at practice and it's toward the end of practice and I'm teaching the players a drill. And I look up and nobody's paying attention to me. So I look where the players are looking and it was at the door, you know, to the gym, to come into the gym. And Jordan had come into the gym as a dad to get his kids and take them home after practice. And my brother looked at him and said, mm, hey, Michael, you're a little bit of a distraction. Would you mind waiting out in the hall until practice is over? And Jordan and his wife are incredibly gracious people. And he said, sure, coach, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll wait outside until practice is over. And my brother thought later, gee, I'm probably the only coach in the history of basketball that ever kicked Michael Jordan out of practice, you know? <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting. I thought maybe you'd go down to the path of, hey, by the way, my brother played against you in the late 70s, early 80s. No, he didn't say that, huh? He didn't. No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, that Wolfpack team, wasn't it? Derek Wittenberg threw up yeah. that shot and Lorenzo Charles? Lorenzo Charles, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's probably one of the greatest finishes oh, yeah. of, the, of tournament history. That whole, yeah. That, so you you played against both of those teams, basically. We did. Any other, any other names of players that... Again, this, this is Mike Boland being a fanboy. Anybody else you can think of real quick? And we'll get, So in, in high school in Chicago, I played against, I was in the same conference. As a matter of fact, we sat together at the, the all-conference banquet, Isaiah Thomas, who would go on to play at, at Indiana for Bobby Knight, uh, win a national championship, yeah. and then go on to the Detroit Pistons and win a couple 
NBA championships. Um, Mark Aguirre. I mean, there were guys that went to Iowa. There was, I, I mean, there was, you know, it was Chicago. I mean, it, at the yeah. time it was kind of a Mecca of, of basketball talent. So I, I, I probably have forgotten some of the really great people that, that I've played against, but it was, it was just a magical time for lack of a better word in my life. I, I loved playing basketball. I loved being able to compete against the best of the best. So it, it just a great opportunity. Okay, well, thank you for answering those questions. If I'm not mistaken, that team that Isaiah won the championship on was 81. So if you think about it, 81, 82, and 83, That's you played true. against players that played for all the national championships. That's quite an amazing feat. That's, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Sure. As you progressed on with your life, you talked about working for Wendy's and then even getting into law enforcement. But one of the things that you did in law enforcement was get into it at, a, at an age where a lot of people don't. So what is that story about? Yeah. So, the, you know, if you understand the backstory, I'm going to tell you, my resume looks like makes a little more sense and doesn't look like a Super Bowl went off in the room. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's all over the place. So my grandfather, my dad's father was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954 and was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It was not a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle in 1933. And my dad was an infant at the time. And he, rem he remembered the stories that my grandmother told of that knock on the door of, you know, Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, come with us. Your husband's been shot. So when I expressed an interest in following in my grandfather's footsteps, my father was absolutely not. You're going to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. But that's the life my father wanted me to live. So when I graduated from college, I had probably one of the first major choices as, as an adult. It was, I could have said, sorry, dad, I'm going to go blaze my own trail and do my own thing. Or knowing that you're dying out of love and respect for you, I will do what you want me to do. So I ended up going into business because that's what my dad wanted me to do. And Mike, one of the things I'm most proud about in my life, and I don't mean to sound conceited about this, is that I never let my dream die. You know, I never said, hey, you know, I'm making decent money as a hospital administrator. I'm comfortable. Everything's great. It just wasn't what I was supposed to do. It wasn't what was in my heart. And so I sort of joke. I did what every good son did. I waited until my father passed away. <laughs> And I followed my own dreams and became a 37-year-old rookie police officer. Yeah, and as you said earlier, you could probably, this whole episode could be about some of those stories that you encountered while you're out there. And where was that at? Was that in Chicago? Was that in Colorado? That was in Cincinnati. Uh, or, wife, or Cincinnati, we, my bad. Yeah, yeah. We had moved to Cincinnati from California where... Uh, our daughter was born, and, and I started in Cincinnati in law enforcement. I, I took a course at City College and became a reserve police officer with the city of Santa Barbara. And my wife will tell you the story. I worked all week at my, my regular job. I was a customer service manager. And then Friday night, I would come home, put on the uniform, go to roll call, work all night as a police officer. And she said, you would come home Saturday morning exhausted, but with this big grin on your face. And she said, I knew that that's what you were going to do for the rest of your life. Yeah, that, that's great. I want to read a, a quote that I read from you. And this kind of sums up to me everything that you were about to a certain extent, your, your, your passion, uh, your willingness to help others. We'll talk about a great book that you have written in just a second. But I want to read this quote. My purpose has changed again to put as much goodness and positivity, love and motivation back into the world. So I think your purpose can change over time. You can have multiple purposes. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up right now is because you're talking about the life and all of the things that you have done. What is the purpose and what motivates you now to as you move forward in your life? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I was given a death sentence 12 years ago. So I, I, I felt I've been on borrowed time for, forever. And so, you know, having a purpose, I think, is incredibly important. Viktor Frankl who wrote Man's Search for Meaning and uh, was a Holocaust survivor during World War II said that people should not look for an abstract meaning of life. Basically he said, we're all here for a reason. There's a reason you were put here and you have a moral responsibility to find that reason or reasons and live them. And that's what I want. And that's what I, you know, like I said, started out playing basketball, felt I was an athlete. That was my purpose. Then it was law enforcement. And now it's changed again. 
So I learned that, I think, from my father. When my father was dying, he had end-stage breast cancer in the 1980s. They really didn't know how to treat a man with breast cancer. So they told him to go home and die. And he lived another three and a half years, and I believe he did because he had a purpose. He was in real estate. He actually worked up till two weeks before he died. And I sort of tucked that in the back of my mind and said, well, you know, when it's my time in the barrel, I, I need to have something positive to focus on. And what I've learned during this journey, I'd like to offer to people with the caveat that I don't have all the answers. I, you know, it's not like do this and it's your self-help program and you will be a great person. I don't know if you will or not, but certain things have worked for me. And really my purpose now is to try to put them out there in the hopes that they work for other people. Yeah, and, and some of what you you have done is, is write the book. And I want to get the name of that book. Let me... And, do you have it? Uh, I know you. Have I do. It. I apologize for you. No, that's okay. The Two book's years. called Sustainable Excellence, Thank 10 you. Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. Talk about that. I, I read all the reviews on Amazon, which are just glowing to say the least. What was it like? What inspired you to do it? And wh where do you, what do you want to continue to do as you move forward? I never wanted to write a book. I, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, I never really did want to write a book. There's sort of an old joke that says, and feel free to use this, I know, in your comedy routine if you want to. <laughs> that, um, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So God has never talked to me. And never. God never said, Terry, write a book. But I think what God did is he put enough people in my path that said, you should write a book, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I think I'm smart enough when enough people start saying something that maybe I ought to pay attention to it. So Sustainable Excellence was really born, I guess, out of two conversations that I had. One was with a former player that I had coached in high school who had moved to the area in Colorado where my wife and I live with her fiance. And the four of us had dinner one night. And I remember saying to her after dinner that I was excited that she was living close and I could watch her find and live her purpose. And Mike, she got real quiet for a while. And then she looked at me and she said, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have absolutely no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then I had a young man reach out to me on social media and he asked me what I thought were the most important things that he should learn, not to just be successful in his job or in business, but to be successful in life. And I didn't want to give him that, you know, get up early, work hard, help other. I, I didn't want to give him sort of the cliches that we all know. I wanted to see if I could go deeper with him. So I took some time and eventually wrote some notes and kind of had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And so I sent them to him. And then I stepped back and I was like, well, you know, I got a life story that fits underneath that principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates this principle. So literally during the months that I was healing after I had my leg amputated, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles. And that's how Sustainable Excellence came to be. Sustainable Excellence is a book about success. I'm working on another book now that I hope is, is about another word that begins with S and that's significance. Success is what we do for us. Significance is what we do for other people. Now, don't get me wrong. I think you can be both. You can be successful and significant. But this second book is going to focus more on how we can make a difference in other people's lives. That's a great way to put it. What is the website where people can learn more about you? I'll have a link in the description. But in case people just happen to be just listening, I'd like for them to hear the, the URL. Yeah, it's motivationalcheck.com. Motivational checks, all one word motivationalcheck.com go check that out I'm, there's links to the book there's links to your story which is absolutely amazing and one of the things I read about you as well is you focus on the four healthy aspects of being sick by concentrating on your four truths to help others lead an extraordinary life what are those four truths yeah the four truths I have them on a post-it note here in my office so I see them multiple times during the day and they constantly get reinforced in my mind and they're just one sentence each so Truth number one is control your mind or your mind is going to control you. 
Truth number two is embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that pain and difficulty to make you a stronger and more resilient individual. Truth number three, I kind of look at more as a legacy type of truth, and it's this, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. Wow. And then truth number four, I think is pretty self-explanatory. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I, I look at those four truths, I call them sort of the bedrock of my soul. I think they're just a good place to try to start to build a quality life from. I have them too. I'm going to make sure they're on a posted note in my office here because I think they're fantastic. What is something that you would like people to understand about your, your journey as an amputee? I know there's a lot to your cancer journey as well that you're continuing on, but what is something you'd like people to understand as life with an amputee that maybe you didn't know before? I, I guess let me, let me tell you a story that, that I think will, will answer that question. Um, this true story happened back in the 1950s. There was a professor at Johns Hopkins University who did a very simple experiment with rats. He took rats and he put them in a tank of water that was over their head. And he wanted to see how long the average rat could tread water before it would sink and drown. And the average rat treaded water for about 15 minutes. And just as those rats were getting ready to sink and drown, he reached in, grabbed them, pulled them out, dried them off and let them rest for a while. And then he took the exact same rats and put them back in that exact same tank of water. And the second time around, on average, those rats treaded water for 60 hours. Now think about that. The first time, 15 minutes. It's not like you're gonna flunk a test or your business is gonna go under. You're gonna die. Your life is gonna be over. And the second time around, 60 hours, which taught me two things. And I think this applies to being an amputee. Number one, the importance of hope in our lives. That if you know you're doing the right thing, no matter what your circumstances are, if you know you're doing the right thing, maybe not today, maybe not this month, maybe not even this year, but at some point in time, more than likely, not no guarantees, more than likely you will get to where you want to be. And the second thing it taught me was just how much more our physical bodies can handle than we ever thought they could. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we all have a breaking point. But I think that breaking point is so much further down the road. We quit, we give up, we give in long before our body needs to. And a lot of that goes back to the, the four truths we were talking about. That first one, controlling your mind. Because your mind tells you, ooh, this is uncomfortable. This hurts. I don't like this. Stop doing that. If you can push through that, if you can control your mind, it's amazing what your body can do. I had never heard that story with the with the rats. That's uh, rats or mice. I apologize if I'm. It was rats. Okay, didn't know if I had the wrong marsupial. That would be terrible <laughs> of me to do that. So, what is next for you now? What are you looking forward to as you as you move on in your life and continue to do great things? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess God will put it in my path, whatever that ends up being. I mean, I continue. To, to be guests on podcasts. I'm, I'm writing this second book. I never thought I would write a second book, just like I never thought I would write a first book. Um, and, and I'm speaking more. Now that COVID is, is more manageable, I, I'm getting out, doing more virtual, some in-person speaking engagements as well. And just being with people. I One of the nurses that takes care of me is a former hospice nurse and is now in, in the infusion center where I get treated. And I love it when she takes care of me because we we get into the nitty gritty of dying and stuff like that. And, and I love talking about that. I love, you know, thinking back to the, the stoic philosophers who talked about momentum mori, you know, remember death, remember that it's coming because death, death is important because it makes us live. It, it makes us give, it gives some credence to, we got to hurry up and do this because we're not going to be around forever. And the interesting thing, she recommended two books. One called Being Mortal, which I would absolutely recommend to people, and the other one called Imagine Heaven. And Imagine Heaven is a book about people who experienced near-death experiences and then came back to talk about it. <laughs> and the thing I found interesting in that book is that no matter who the person was and no matter who they encountered during their near-death experience, whether it was God or Jesus or an angel or a saint or a relative or a friend, 
the one question everybody got asked was how are you treating my children or how did you treat my children? In other words, how do we treat each other? And I think that's such an important thing. You know, I don't want to throw religion on, on people if they're not religious, but you know, Jesus is in the Bible was asked, you know, what are the most important commandments? The number one, love your, the God above all other gods. And number two is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that's what that question goes to. How do we treat each other? And if, if I can do anything in whatever time I have left, it's how can I treat people better? How can I be an exemplar of treating people better? I fail miserably along the times, especially when I'm being treated and I feel sick and beat up and tired and stuff like that. But it's that connection with people. If, if I can be remembered for anything, it's that I had a connection with other people. And you certainly do. You've uh, really, your story today, as I listen to it, I'll be honest, you connected with me and you helped me. And I'm sure the listeners on this podcast will also be very appreciative of everything you've talked about today. And I, I'd love to have you on again. I think there's more to this story as you move forward and continue to do the great things. But right now, I know I've taken a, quite a bit of your time when, you, when we think about the, the pre-conversation and then this conversation. So Terry, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time to be on the We're Not Some podcast. Well, Mike, thank, thank you very much for having me on. I really enjoyed talking with you today. That was the We're Not Stump podcast, hosted by Mike Bowling. If you want to be a guest on the program, reach out to Mike at his email address, mike at mikebowling.com. This podcast is produced by One Hand Man Productions. If you are looking to start your podcast, go to onehandmanproductions.com.